Hey, blessings to you. It's Pastor Mike Miano of the Blue Point Bible Church, and I want to take us through our next installment of Thinking Through Scripture. We're going to do Exodus chapters 4 through 6, and I had promised earlier that we'd get on here at about 1130 and get through our reading. That way tomorrow we can begin with 7 through chapter 9. And I just want to catch us up on our reading. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open us in a moment of prayer. Um, you know, there's something about doing these late night studies. I remember when I had studied monasticism and I studied about the monks that would stay up till, you know, all hours of the night praying and making sure they're lifting up prayers for the saints. So uh, it is, it's really encouraging to uh, to kind of be right here um, in late night and uh, opening up in a word of prayer, praying, seeing healing happen in our land and diving into the scriptures. So Thank you for taking part in it. God bless you. Peace to those of you that are joining. And uh, let's open up with a moment of prayer and then jump right into our reading. Again, Exodus chapters 4 through 6. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you all the glory, Lord. We ask that you go before us in our study, Lord. Prepare our hearts and our minds to receive from you. Lord, we thank you for all that you give us that pertains to life and godliness. We ask that you would continue to give us a spirit of walking worthy, Lord, that you would go before us and prepare the way, as you did for ancient Israel, Lord, that, that we would look to such a beautiful example of your faithfulness and worship you for it and desire to see it in our lives. We give you all the glory, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So let's jump right into our reading. Now, where we left off this morning was that in Exodus chapter 3, Moses was blessed, right? He, he, uh, in the middle of working, he was working hard over in the land of Midian, outside of Canaan. And God had come to him, sent a messenger to him, an angel. And that messenger now uh, basically tells them that they're going to have a covenant that he's going to go before Pharaoh. He's going to lead the people out. And what I respect about Moses is humble attitude. You know, right away he's asking, who am I that God would send me? Who am I that Israel is going to listen to me? Who am I that Moses is, um, you know, that Moses is going, I mean, that Israel is going to listen to me? Who am I that the Pharaoh is going to listen to me? And you see that right here. I'm going to read uh, Exodus chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. It says, And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. So we see the Lord is going to go before Israel, and he's going to make them favorable in the eyes of the Egyptians. And again, you see, that's only going to be a work of the Lord, as if you've read up to this point, you know that the Pharaoh and the, the leaders in Egypt, they're not exactly happy with the Canaanites. They're expecting that this is going to be, you know, uh, it's going to cause oppression upon the Israelites. So that's what we're seeing here. Now, we're going to move into chapter four, and we're going to see that there's going to be signs to follow Moses. You know, and I had said this this morning, that we still have the same miraculous things that follow us, except our miraculous things might not be turning a staff into a snake. Our miraculous things might be seeing a heroin addict to find sobriety. Um, you know, that those are the miracles that follow the people of God when we walk worthy of our call to bring healing in the land, to demolish the stronghold and lead all thoughts captive to Christ. So moving into Genesis, um, Exodus chapter 4, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep doing that probably the next couple of days because we're transitioning our reading. So Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 9 uh, he's going to turn this staff into a snake, right? That's one of the miracles. He's told to put his hand inside his coat, and he pulls it out. It has leprosy on it. He puts it back in. It's healed. And then water from the Nile is turned into blood. Um, those are the three things that the Lord gives Moses in chapter 4 to show him that he is going with him. And even after all of that, uh, verse 10, Moses says, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent. Neither in the past nor since you I have spoken as your servant, since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And, you know, when I first had read this, and obviously our first immediate response is, wow, he's so humble. However, it's not necessarily humility that's being shown here. What it sounds like is that Moses thinks that this is going to be by his strength. You know, how, how often do we have to be reminded that the, the miracles that we see, the beautiful things that we see are not by our strength, not by our hand. That, uh, you know, it's God going before us. Look at God's response. The Lord says to him, who gave humans, human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. And then Moses almost, he pleads, he turns back, he says, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. And then it says here that the Lord's anger burned against Moses. You know, this had a lot to do with my uh, personal prayer life today. 
that the Lord's anger burns against us when we stifle the gift within us, when we stifle what God is seeking to do in and through us. Galatians 2.20 says that the Apostle Paul remarked that I am crucified with Christ. It is not me, but he who is being seen through me. Uh, it's important for us to really take into consideration that we're not to stifle the gift that is, that is within us. We are not to uh, allow our what we see as our incapabilities to block what God is about to do in and through us. And that's so important to walk in line with. When I was led to Christ, I uh, had a, a brother that had taught me about embracing my vulnerabilities, embracing who I am, embracing the unique person that God has designed me to be. Struggles, obstacles, sins and all. And allow that to truly uh, work within me and, and then discern God's call on my life and to walk worthy of that call. All the while recognizing my vulnerabilities and being honest with them and, and you know, um, brushing myself off and having to challenge myself to move further in my walk, walking worthy with God. So we see here that the Lord is angry with Moses. And then this is ultimately the call of Aaron. Aaron is about to be the mouthpiece for Moses. And uh, then what we see as we move forward is, I wrote in my notes, the raising up, raising up the responsibility of a son of God. And I want to share that with you here um, about Israel being the son of God. Moses goes back to Jethro, his father. He says that, you know, I'm going to go let my people go. And right here in verse, let's do 21. Start at verse 21, chapter 4. It says, The Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before a Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. I will kill your firstborn. So you notice here that God calls Israel his firstborn. I had highlighted that in my notes. And what I wrote was that uh, there's a responsibility of the sons of God. The sons of God are those that are uh, those that are responsible to do the work of God. That's what a son of God is. Jesus was a son of God. Israel is a son of God. We, through Jesus Christ, are sons of God. We have the responsibility to do the work of God, to represent God, to be his image on earth. And that is what uh, Mo Moses is going to the Pharaoh saying, that this is God's son. Israel is God's son. They are his people. They are to be his image to the nations. And God must let him go. And uh, so then we move into the chapter and we continue to see that. Uh, I found this very interesting, actually. I wanted to stop here. Uh, verse 24 through 26 at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zephora, his wife, took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So let the Lord leave him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. That she had just done this work here to uh, save his life. I, I'll read the note here in this cultural background study Bible. It says this. Zephora's act of circumcision is important. It appears to, to function as the expiation, the purging, the atonement for the guilt, pollution, or blood that Moses is still carrying around and on account of which Yahweh attacks him. It is hard to say, however, exact, exactly how circumcision accomplishes this expiation. There is a Phoenician myth in which the god Kronos circumcises himself and therefore seems to halt an impending plague. Kronos immolated his only son to his father, Oranos, and circumcised himself, forcing the allies who were with him to do the same. This myth reflects a belief that circumcision could quell divine wrath. So it does see that that could be a part of it here. And then continuing into the rest of the notes, in light of all this, Sephora's comment about a bridegroom of blood probably contains a pair of double meanings. First, Moses is a bridegroom of blood because he still possesses the blood or pollution that resulted from his homicide. But also because of the bloody circumcision that Sephora performs. The other double meaning comes from the Hebrew word for bridegroom, hatan. The verb form of this word in the Hebrew and Arabic means to become a relative of by means of marriage. But the etymology of this word leads to another verb that means to circumcise. By the word bridegroom, then, Zipporah refers to both a bridegroom and to circumcise to a circumcised one. This suggests that Moses is indeed circumcised symbolically by her act. In the end, the circumcision cleanses Moses and thereby appeases Yahweh's anger. So again, interesting story there, interesting uh, details to share. And then we see the result in verses 29 through 31 that Israel falls before God, says that they are going to obey this covenant and they are going to listen. 
Moving into chapter 5, Moses is now going to Pharaoh, walking worthy of this, to say, let my people go. And of course, the Pharaoh's response in verse 2 is, who is the Lord? I don't know him. Matter of fact, I'll read it to you. Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, the, Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with a plague. It's important to know that we're talking about the God of the Hebrews. We're not universalists. So we're talking about the specific God that was making his plan known through Israel, the God of the Hebrew people. In my book, Wicked, that was published earlier this week, you'll see I talk a lot about the Hebraic faith, the Hebraic culture, and why it's so important to be in line with that spirituality rather than the spirituality of the pagan cultures. Um, unfortunately, Hellenism has crept in and affected the 21st century Christians very much, um, sadly, without our even knowing. So we see that uh, things get worse in chapter 5 between the Pharaoh and the Israelites, that, you know, the Pharaoh is not willing to let them go. He believes that they're just being lazy, that they're trying to call this worshiping God and being lazy rather than actually walking worthy of what they're supposed to be doing over there in Egypt, which is working hard and being his slaves. Then, of course, th this is God doing this. This is God and his sovereignty doing this. So we know God's going to promise deliverance. The Lord's mighty hand is going to work. It says here in Exodus chapter 6, verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God then appeared to Moses again. I am the Lord. I appeared with Abraham, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as the Almighty. But my, by my name, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I, am also, I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites and the, who the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with the mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with an uplifted hand to give Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. And then Moses reports this to the Israelites. They did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let Israel go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, If the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me since I speak with faltering lips? Again, you see, there's Moses going back to that, that uh, point there about him not feeling as though he can walk worthy. So that's where I'm going to complete our reading for today because then the next thing you see is a little bit of a lineage there between Mar Moses and Aaron and uh, the final verses, the last two verses that we're reading here in Exodus chapter 6 is that now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with faltering lips, why would the Pharaoh listen? Again, you see a very, what should be very clear is a failure of Moses, of Israel, to see that the Lord is doing this. Not you, not you by your faltering lips and your non-eloquent speech. No, God is going to work through you and do something mighty. He's allowed for you to be born, Moses. He allowed for the providence of God to take care of you. Why can that not be enough? Israel, God has done so much for you. Why can that not be enough? They're not clinging to the story of their patriarchs. They're instead, they're going over to doubt, which is akin to idolatry. And you're going to see that God's faithfulness is going to speak wonders through this story. Again, that's why Passover is one of the most noted celebrations of, um, of the Jews of Israel. Um, Passover is a very big deal because it's God reaching out his mighty hand and doing something mighty for them in the midst of their oppression and slavery in Egypt. So that's where we're at in our reading. I pray that you've been blessed by this. I'm just going to end us with a quick praise. And tomorrow we're going to get into all the fun stuff plagues and you know all that good stuff and one, another thing i want to talk about tomorrow is the historicity of the exodus the plagues that are going to happen during the exodus and also i had an interesting study note here i'm going to share with you tomorrow in regards to god's name i am who i am exodus chapter 3 verse 14 when he tells moses don't worry tell them i am who i am has sent you we'll talk more about that tomorrow i pray you've been blessed by these two videos today glad that we were able to catch up now we're at exodus chapter 6 Tomorrow we're going to move into Exodus chapter 7 through 9. And I know God has been glorified as we look into Scripture, we think through Scripture. And I pray that you're being edified. So let's just go to the Lord with a quick praise. And I thank you again for tuning in. Heavenly Father, we give you all the glory, Lord. We thank you for going before us. We thank you that your word always speaks to us, that your faithfulness, your sovereignty, and the, the fact that you work through us, Lord, mere human beings, um, is astounding. 
truly should humble us. It should cause us to true worship, Lord, to fall on our knees and our hands and to just be in complete reverence of you and your will. We thank you, Lord, for going before us. We thank you for your mighty plan. We give you all the glory, Lord, in, in and through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again for uh, tuning in. I, I thank you, all of you that made nice comments and said nice things. I pray that you've been blessed by this study and that you'll continue to be blessed as we think through Scripture. Please know that you can find me on Facebook, Michael Miano. You can also email me at ChristianityGoneWild at Yahoo.com, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have as we're going through the reading or maybe some things that you're finding on your own time. Please send me an email. I'd love to talk to you, love to detail and answer any questions. And let God be glorified by our being honest with Scripture. Amen. Go in peace, saints. God bless you.